this is the story of every UPSC aspirant. Where to start from? Which subject should I start with? Which books do I refer? How do I analyze previous year questions? Which option should I opt for? Does everyone need a guiding hand? Do you need coaching? Do I need coaching? How should I start my preparation? Do you feel lost in all these questions? Come join Yes UPSC family and let us guide you through this preparation to become an IS and not just an aspirant. Yes UPSC, guiding you to success. Hello, today we are going to start history module of NCRT program by Yes UPSC with class 6 NCRT R past 1 which covers entire ancient Indian history right from early times till post Gupta period. So let us have a look at the index and see what topics are covered in this book. Chapter 1 What, Where, How and When talks about the sources of ancient Indian history. The second chapter From Hunting Gathering to Growing Food covers the Stone Ages. The third chapter in the earlier cities talks about the Indus Valley Civilization. The fourth chapter What Books and Burials Tell Us covers the Vedic Age and Megalithic Culture. The fifth chapter, Kingdoms, Kings and an Early Republic, talks about the Janpadas and Mahajanpadas. The sixth chapter, New Questions and Ideas, talks about rise of two new religions, Buddhism and Jainism. Seventh chapter covers the modern age in general and King Ashoka in particular. Chapters 8 and 9 covers the postmodern age and trade and urbanization. Chapters 10 and 11 covers the Gupta age, the post-Gupta age and the sources of these periods. So these are the topics that are discussed in this book and we will cover them one by one in our videos. So let us start with the first chapter, what, where, how and when which gives us a brief overview of the things we learn when we study history and the sources of history. The chapter discusses a range of topics like what can we learn when we study history, the geographical spread of early people, how do we know about the past, why did people used to travel in the past, how our country got its names and how the events of the past are dated. So what can we know about our past? That is what are the things we learn when we study history. We learn about lives of different groups of people. We learn about their occupation, their culture, etc. We get to know about the food people used to eat. When we study about the food, we learn about the procurement method. We also study about the kinds of clothes people used to wear, which helps us understand the weather of that particular region and that particular period. We get to know about the houses in which people used to live. When we study houses, we learn about the material they used to make their houses, where did the material come from and what was the method or technique used by them to build the houses. The history also tells us about the games children used to play, the stories they heard, plays they played and the songs they sang. All these things helps us to understand how our society has evolved and what are the changes that have taken place over the time. So the next question that arises is where did early people used to live? The chapter talks about different regions from where we get the traces of people living in the past. The chapter talks about the Narmada region in central India, Suleiman and Kirthar hills in the northwest region of the Indian subcontinent, the Garo hills in northeast, Vindhyas again in central India and the region covered by river Indus and its tributaries and river Ganga and its tributaries. So these are the different regions that are discussed in this chapter. Now let us have a look at them one by one. So the early people living on the banks of river Narmada were gatherers that are the people who used to gather their own food. 
These people had vast knowledge of plants as they were dependent on their surrounding forest for food. They also hunted animals. So the early people who used to live on the banks of river Narmada were hunters and gatherers. Moving on to Suleiman and Kirthar hills, some of the areas where men and women first began to grow crops such as wheat and barley about 8000 years ago are located here. People also began rearing animals like sheep, goat and cattle and we also get the traces of early village settlements from this region as domestication of plants and animals made it necessary to stay at one place for longer period of time. Agriculture also developed in the areas of Garo hills and Vindhas. The places where rice was first grown are to the north of Vindhas. About 4,700 years ago, some of the earliest cities flourished on the banks of river Indus and its tributaries. These were the cities of Harappan civilization or the Indus Valley civilization. After a gap of 2000 years, that is about 2500 years ago, we find that cities again started developing but this time on the banks of river Ganga and its tributaries. So the area south of the Ganga was known as Magadh. This was the period of Mahajanpadas when we see the rise of powerful rulers and large kingdoms. People have travelled from one part of the subcontinent to another throughout history. But why did people used to travel? Development of kingdoms provided political and economic stability which gave impetus to trade and urbanization. So people moved from one place to another in search of better opportunities. There were some religious teachers who used to travel on foot from one place to another preaching their religious teachings. Some people might have travelled from one one place to another to escape natural disasters. Some people also travel in search of livelihood. Some people perhaps travel driven by a spirit of adventure wanting to discover new and exciting places. Besides, merchants traveled with caravans or ships carrying valuable goods from one place to another. All this led to sharing of ideas between people and enrichment of our cultural traditions. Now let us see how our country got its name. Two of the words we often use for our country are India and Bharat. The word India comes from the river Indus called Sindhu in Sanskrit. The Iranians and the Greeks who came through the northwest about 2500 years ago called the river Indus Hindus or Indos and the land to the east of river Indus as India. The name Bharata was used for a group of people who lived in the northwest and who are mentioned in the Rig Veda. Later on, it was used for the country. So, how can we find out about the past? There are several ways in which we can find out about the past. The first is to search for and read the books that were written long time ago. These books are known as manuscripts as these were written by hand. These were mainly written on palm leaves or a specially prepared bark of a tree known as birch which is found in Himalayas. And as these books were written on palm leaves, many manuscripts were eaten away by insects or some were destroyed. But many of these were often preserved in temples and monasteries. These manuscripts deal with all kinds of subjects ranging from religious practices and beliefs to the lives of kings and medicine and science. Besides, there were epics, poems and plays. Many of these were written in Sanskrit while others were written in Prakrit or Tamil language. The second way to find out about the past is to study inscriptions. Inscriptions are writings on hard surface like stones or metals. The study of inscriptions is called epigraphy. Sometimes kings got their orders inscribed so that people could see, read and obey them. There are other kinds of inscriptions as well where men and women recorded what they did. This image is of the Kandahar inscription of Ashoka which was written in two different languages with Greek on top and Aramaic on bottom and we get to know with the help of this inscription that these languages that are Greek and Aramaic were used in Kandahar region. 
Lastly, we can also find out about the past with the help of archaeological objects. These are the objects that were made and used in the past. People who study archaeological objects are called archaeologists. They study the remains of buildings made of stones and bricks. They also explore and excavate to find tools, weapons, pots, pans, ornaments and coins that were used in the past. The study of coins is known as numismatics. Archaeologists also look for bones of animals, birds and fish to find out what people used to eat in the past. Archaeologists also study inscriptions, plant remains and old manuscripts. So these are the tools that help us find out about the past. The information found from manuscripts, inscriptions and archaeology is known as source. For the period which we have only archaeological objects as source are known as prehistory. Next is the period of proto-history for which we have written materials but cannot be used as source of information as writing might not have yet been deciphered like the Indus Valley Civilization. The last period is the history period for which we have written as well as archaeological objects as source of information. We have learned that there were different groups of people living in different parts of the country. So the question arises is that was there one past for all the people or were there different pasts for different groups of people? The past was different for different groups of people as the lives of hunters and gatherers differed from that of life of kings and queens. The lives of merchants were different from lives of craftspersons. So the lives of different groups of people was different. People followed different practices and customs in different parts of the country. They ate different kind of food and, and wore different kinds of clothes. Besides, we have a great deal of information about the lives of kings and the battles they fought because they used to keep records of their battles. Generally, ordinary people did not keep records, so we have to rely on archaeology for all the information that we have about them. The next question that the chapters discusses is what do dates mean? Why do we use terms like before Christ, before common era and before present with some dates and anno domini and common era with some other? And how do we use them and what do they mean? So let us understand this with the help of a timeline. We are living in the year 2021 which is our present. But we have recently discussed events as old as 8000 years ago where we find the earliest traces of crop growing in Suleiman and Kirthar hills. So how is it possible that some event took place 8000 years ago and we are living in the year 2021 where are the remaining 6000 years? This is because we calculate the year 2021 from the year of birth of Jesus Christ that took place in 1 AD where AD stands for Anno Domini meaning in the year of the Lord. You should keep in mind that there is no zero year. We calculate the events from 1 AD only. The year before 1 AD is 1 BC. There is no zero year. For the events taking place after the birth of Jesus Christ, we use terms like common era that is CE and Anno Domini that is AD. For the events that took place before the birth of Jesus Christ, we use terms like before common era that is BCE or before Christ that is BC. We also sometimes use terms like before present where the event is calculated from the present times. So these are some important things that you should remember when you are studying history because dates are an important part of history. Keeping the things that we have learned from the first chapter in our minds, let us move to the second chapter from hunting gathering to growing food. The chapter covers the stone ages. It discusses the lives of the earliest people who inhabited the Indian subcontinent. It talks about the sources that help us to understand their lives better. It also covers the geographical spread from where we get the evidences of earliest people and why did the early people used to move from one place to another. 
It also discusses the changes in the environment that made possible domestication of plants and animals by some of the early people and made settled life possible. The first topic of the chapter is the earliest people, why were they on the move? The important thing here is to understand who were the earliest people. The earliest people who inhabited the Indian subcontinent were hunters and gatherers who lived on the subcontinent about 2 million years ago. These were the people who hunted animals or gathered their food. So why were they on the move? There are at least four reasons why hunter-gatherers moved from place to place. First is, if they had stayed at one place for a long time, they would have eaten up all available plant and animal resources. Therefore, the resources would have been depleted from that region and they had to go elsewhere in search of food. The second reason is that animals move from one place to another, either in search of smaller prey or in the case of deer, in search of grass and leaves. That is why those who hunted them had to follow their movements. The third reason is plants and trees bear fruit in different seasons. So people may have moved from season to season in search of different kinds of plants. The fourth reason is that plants, animals and people need water to survive. People who people living on the banks of seasonal rivers would have had to go in search of water during the dry seasons. So these are the four main reasons why people moved from one place to another. Besides, they may have traveled to meet their friends and relatives. The next question that the chapter discusses is how do we know about these people? That is the sources that help us to understand the lives of early people. Archaeologists have found some of the things hunters and gatherers made and used. The most important thing out of these is the tools they used. Early people used to make tools of three things, stones, spoons and wood, out of which the stone tools have survived the best. These tools may have been used to cut meat and bone, scrape bark from trees and hides to make clothes. The tools might have also been used to chop fruit and roots. Some of the tools might have been attached to handles to make spears and arrows for hunting. We also learn about the lives of early people with the help of bones. The bones of animals help us to understand that which animals were hunted by these people. Some tools were used to chop wood which was used to make firewoods. Wood was also used to make huts and tools. These two images show example of how tools might have been used. The first image shows the how the stone tool might have been used to dig the ground and collect edible roots. The second image shows how the skin of an animal might have been scraped to stitch clothes. So the next topic that the chapter discusses is choosing a place to live in. That is what was the criteria used by early people to find a place to live. The map here shows some important archaeological sites. Out of these sites, the Paleolithic sites are the places from where we get the evidences of early people, hunters and gatherers. Hunters and gatherers lived in many more places but only three are discussed here that are Bhimbetka, Hunski and Kurnul Caves. So what was the reason behind choosing these places? We see that these sites are located near sources of water. So water was one of the criteria behind choosing the place to live. As stone tools were important, people tried to find places where good quality stone was easily available. Places where stone was found and where people made tools are known as factory sites. So how do we know where these factories were? Usually we find blocks of stone tools that were made and perhaps discarded because they were not perfect and chips of waste stone left behind at these sites. Sometimes people lived here for longer spells of times. These sites are called habitation cum factory sites. Hunski is one such site. The sites where early people used to live were known as habitation sites. Bhimbetka is one such site. Bhimbetka is in present day Madhya Pradesh. 
Habitation sites include caves and rock shelters as the people chose natural caves as they provided shelter from the rain, heat and wind. Natural caves and rock shelters are found in the Vindhyas and the Deccan Plateau. We find traces of ash from Kurnool caves suggesting that people were familiar with use of fire. Fire might have been used as a source of light to cook meat and to scare away animals. Many of the caves in which people used to live have paintings. These paintings show wild animals and are a great source of information to learn about lives of early people. We just now came across the term Paleolithic. Archaeologists have divided the Stone Age period into three groups, Paleolithic Age, Mesolithic Age and Neolithic Age. They call the earliest period the Paleolithic. This comes from two Greek words, paleo meaning old and lithic meaning stone. The name points to the importance of finds of stone tools. The Paleolithic period extends from 2 million years ago to about 12,000 years ago. Paleolithic age is further divided into Lower Paleolithic age, Middle Paleolithic age and Upper Paleolithic age with Lower Paleolithic age being the oldest. This long span of time covers 99% of human history. The period when we find environmental changes beginning about 12,000 years ago till about 10,000 years ago is called the Mesolithic Age, meaning Middle Stone. This is thus called because it is the transitional phase between Old Stone Age and New Stone Age. The stone tools found during this period are generally tiny and are called microliths. Microliths were probably stuck onto the handles of bone or wood to make tools such as saws and sickles. At the same time, older varieties of tools continue to be in use. The next stage from about 10,000 years ago is known as the Neolithic Age or New Stone Age. We find this was the period when agriculture began. The tools used during the Neolithic age were polished, giving sharp edges to the tools. So we see that the three different stone ages has different type of tools, even though the tools made in earlier periods still continued to be in use. Let us now discuss the changes that took place in the environmental conditions that led to development of herding and rearing of animals. We just now discussed that around 12,000 years ago, there was a change in the climate. So around 12,000 years ago, there were major changes in climate with a shift to relatively warm conditions. In many areas, this led to development of grasslands, which in turn led to an increase in number of the animals that survived on grass like deer, cattle, sheep, antelope, etc. Those who hunted these animals followed them, learning about their food habits and breeding seasons. It is likely that this helped people to start thinking about herding and rearing these animals themselves. Fishing also became important during this period. The next topic that the chapter discusses is the beginning of farming and herding. This was also a time when several grain-bearing grasses including wheat, barley and rice grew naturally in different parts of the subcontinent. Men and women and children probably collected these grains as food and learnt where they grew and when they ripened. This may have led them to think about growing plants of their own. As the climate of the world was changing and so were plants and animals that people used as food, men, women and children probably observed several things. The places where edible plants were found, how seeds broke off, fell on the ground and new plants sprouted from them. Perhaps they began looking after the plants, protecting them from birds and animals so that they could grow and the seeds could ripen. In this way, people became farmers. Women, men and children could also attract and then tame animals by leaving food for them near shelters. The first animal to be tamed was wild ancestor of dog. Later, people encouraged animals that were relatively gentle and come near the camps where they lived. These animals such as sheep, goat, cattle and 
Also the pig lived in herds and most of them ate grass. Often people protected these animals from attack by other wild animals. This is how they became herders. Let us now discuss what is domestication. Domestication is the name given to the process in which people grow plants and look after animals. But the bigger question is what plants and which animals? People select those plants and animals that are not prone to disease. They also select plants that yield large size grain and have strong stalks capable of bearing the weight of the ripe grain. Seeds from selected plants are preserved and sown to ensure that new plants will have the same qualities. Amongst animals, those animals are selected that are relatively gentler. The domestication of plants and animals began during Mesolithic age about 12,000 years ago when there were major changes in the climate of the world with a shift to relatively warm conditions. Some of the earliest plants to be domesticated were wheat and barley. The earliest domesticated animals include sheep and goat. With the beginning of farming and herding, we see changes in way of life. As people began growing plants, it meant that they had to stay at same place for a long time looking after the plants, watering, weeding, driving away animals and birds till the grain ripened and then the grain had to be stored carefully. As the grain had to be stored, people began thinking of ways of storing it. In many areas, people began making large clay pots or wove baskets or duck pits into the ground to store food. The reared animals acted as source of food in terms of milk and meat. So how do we find out about the first farmers and herders? To find out the settlements of farmers and herders, Archaeologists study evidence of plants and animals' bones. One of the most exciting findings includes remains of burnt grain. Archaeologists can identify these grains and so we know that a number of crops were grown in different parts of the subcontinent. They can also identify the bones of different animals. Some of the important regions from where we find the evidences of first farmers and herders are in the northwest region of the subcontinent or in present day Kashmir and in East and South India. With the beginning of farming and herding, we see a move towards a settled life. Archaeologists have found traces of huts or houses from several sites. In Burza home, that is in present day Kashmir region, pit houses have been found. These pit houses were dug into the ground with steps leading into them. These may have provided shelter in cold weather. Archaeologists have also found cooking hearths both inside and outside the huts, which suggests that, depending on the weather, people could cook food either indoors or outdoors. Some stone tools have also been found from many sites as well. Many of these are different from the earlier Paleolithic tools and were polished to give a fine cutting edge. These tools are known as Neolithic tools as they belong to Neolithic period. Mortars and pestles was used for grinding grain and other plant produce. Some tools were made of bone and the tools of earlier Paleolithic times also continued to be in use. Many kinds of earthen pots have also been found. These were sometimes decorated and were used for storing things. People began using pots for cooking food, especially for grains like rice, wheat and lentils that now became an important part of the diet. Besides, they also began weaving cloth using different kinds of materials, for example, cotton that could now be grown. So this helps us to understand how beginning of farming and herding led to a transition from a hunting gathering society to a settled society in early times. Now let us have a closer look at one of the Neolithic sites, Mehergarh. This site is located in a fertile plain near the Bolan Pass which is one of the most important routes into Iran. Mehergarh was probably one of the places where women and men learned to grow barley, wheat and rear sheep and goats for the first time in this area. It is one of the earliest villages that we know about. 
Archaeologists who excavated the site found evidences of many kinds of animal bones from the earliest levels. These included bones of wild animals such as the deer and pig. In later levels, they found more bones of sheep and goat. And in still later levels, cattle bones are most common, suggesting that this was the animal that was generally kept by the people. Other finds at Mehergarh include remains of square or rectangular houses. Each house had four or more compartments, some of which may have been used for storage. Several burial sites have also been found at Mehergarh. In one instance, the dead person was buried with coats, which were probably meant to serve as food in the next world. This suggests that people living in Mehergarh region might have believed in afterlife. Let us now discuss few questions based on the chapters which we have discussed and are in line with the changing dimension of UPSC examination. The first question is, consider the following statements. Statement 1 says that prehistory referred to that time in the past from which there is no written word or document is available. Second statement is, Tools, pottery and cave paintings are used by the scholars to understand the prehistoric life. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? A. 1 only B. 2 only C. Both 1 and 2 D. Neither 1 nor 2 So we have discussed that prehistory is the period for which we have only archaeological objects as source of information. So the first statement is correct. The second statement suggests that tools, pottery and cave paintings are used by the scholars to understand prehistoric life. We have seen that these are the findings from the prehistoric period which our archaeologists use as source of information. So second statement is also correct. So the answer is option C, both 1 and 2. The second question is, consider the following statements with reference to the Neolithic period or the New Stone Age in India. Statement 1 says that Neolithic settlements of South India are generally older than the ones in Northern India. Statement 2 says that people were largely dependent on hunting, fishing and gathering as cultivation had not yet begun. Option 3 says that Neolithic people used foot wheels to make pots. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? 2 only, 1 and 2 only, 3 only or 1 and 3 only. So the first statement suggests that South Indian Neolithic settlements are older which is incorrect because the oldest known Neolithic site in the Indian subcontinent is Mehergarh site which is attributed to 7000 BC. Neolithic settlements found in South India are not older than 2500 BC. So if statement 1 is incorrect, options B and D are invalid. The second statement says that people were largely dependent on hunting, fishing and gathering as cultivation had not yet begun. This statement again is incorrect as we have just now discussed that people used to grow wheat and barley in Mehergarh region. So this makes option A incorrect. The only option remaining is C3 only. So this is our answer. The third question says, consider the following pairs and gives us Neolithic sites and their present day state. Which of the pairs given above is are correctly matched? Pair first is Burza home with Gujarat. Second pair is Chiran in Bihar. Third pair is Koldiva in Andhra Pradesh. Or fourth pair Mahagara in Uttar Pradesh. The options are 1, 2 and 3 only. B. 2 and 4 only, C 1, 3 and 4 only or option D 1, 2, 3 and 4. That is all options are correct. So we have discussed the Neolithic site of Burza home which is in present day Kashmir region. So the first pair is incorrect which makes options 1, C and D incorrect. So the only remaining option is option B which is our answer. 
So the next question is which one of the following statements is not correct regarding India's ancient history? A. Manuscripts were written by hand on palm leaf. Manuscripts dealt with only religious beliefs and practices. Manuscripts were written in Sanskrit, Prakrit and Tamil languages. Or D. Inscriptions are writings on hard surfaces such as stone or metal. We have discussed that manuscripts are called thus because they are written by hand and since paper was not available, these were written on palm leaves. So statement 1 is correct. Statement B says that manuscripts dealt with only religious beliefs and practices. We discussed that manuscripts dealt with all kinds of subjects ranging from religious subjects to secular. So this statement is incorrect making it our answer.